Hello, my name is Andrea Miles, and on behalf of the Stennis Center for Public Service, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our video series on congressional debate. The Stennis Center is a bipartisan legislative branch agency created by Congress in 1988 to promote and strengthen the highest ideas of public service in America. The mission of the Stennis Center is to attract young people to careers in public service, provide training and development opportunities for senior congressional staff and other public service leaders across the United States. The Stennis Center supports congressional debate because it develops an awareness of the challenges and rewards of public service as students build skills that may someday be applied in a public service career and learn tools to help them participate in civic engagement activities in their communities. We hope this video series provides you an opportunity to learn more about congressional debate and become a successful participant in Student Congress and beyond. For more information on the Stennis Center and congressional debate, please visit our website, www.stennis.gov. Hey everybody, I'm Brett Harvey, the coach of the Mississippi State Debate Team. And I'm Mia Robertson, Speech and Debate Program Assistant at the Stennis Center for Public Service. And we're very happy to be welcoming you to the very first video in the Stennis Center's Congressional Debate Boot Camp video series. This series is designed to take you from the very, very beginning, the basics of congressional debate, all the way to being successful, um, competing in, in congressional debate at an advanced level. So we're happy you're here. First question you might be wondering is, what is congressional debate? It's basically a form of high school debate uh, that simulates an actual legislative chamber. Uh, so you will set the docket, you will debate the proposals, you will decide the outcome on every bill. Uh, and in the process, you'll get to meet people who share your interests, uh, who enjoy debating, and you'll uh, enhance your college resume and maybe even win some awards while you're doing it. And this series is designed to help you do exactly that. We're going to take you through all of the basics of congressional debate and hopefully give you all the skills you'll need to be successful at the activity. But first, we would be remiss if we didn't thank the Stennis Center for Public Service. Um, for a very long time, for years, they've been sponsoring congressional debate at the NSDA National Tournament. They're huge proponents of speech and debate, and we're very excited to be working with them. Now, we do need to start with one quick aside, which is if you're brand new to Student Congress, you may also be new to the larger world that Student Congress is part of. Congressional debate, also known as Student Congress, is part of a, a larger universe uh, called speech and debate competition. Uh, speech and debate tournaments are a fantastic extracurricular activity. They typically happen on weekends, uh, on high school or college campuses. In addition to Student Congress, uh, you have other events like prepared speeches, extemporaneous speaking, uh, interpretation of literature, one-on-one -on -one debate, two-on-two -two debate, and all kinds of different competition. Speech and debate teaches you some critical skills like public speaking, but also things like leadership and research, um, critical thinking, things that you're going to need to be successful in the real world. And that's why speech and debate is one of the most sought after activities on resumes and job applications. And that's why you might see speech and debate on the resumes of our world's and our nation's greatest leaders in STEM, service, um, politics, in business. But like we said earlier, the event we're focusing on today is congressional debate. So we'll start with an overview. Right. So Student Congress, also called congressional debate, is basically, like we said, a simulation of a legislature where students control the legislation, the debate, the questions, really everything about it. Now, before we can get into the strategies for how you do well, uh, in Student Congress, we have to start with a basic discussion of how it works. So a Student Congress session uh, typically happens in a classroom or maybe a lecture hall. They're going to be between 16 and 24 students, and they're going to be playing the role of representatives or senators. Uh, these are going to be the people you're working with. They'll be your colleagues, the people you're trying to persuade, also maybe the people you're trying to, to, to beat, uh, to do better mm -hmm. than. Uh, at larger tournaments, you very well may have multiple rooms. These will be called chambers, and they are all completely separate and independent from one another. And, and who will be in the chamber with you? Usually two people. The first is going to be the parliamentarian. They kind of act as the referee. They ensure that all of the rules are being followed within the chamber. And 
What are those rules? Well, those rules are called parliamentary procedure. Just like in the US Congress, these rules govern exactly how the debate works and how it's structured, how bills come to the floor, how motions are passed, how bills are passed. Parliamentary procedure decides all of that. And uh, most high school and middle school congressional debate rounds use something called Robert's Rules of Order, which has been kind of modified by the National Speech and Debate Association just to streamline, streamline them and make them more efficient. Now, in addition to the parliamentarian, you're going to have a very important person who is the judge, or in some cases, a panel of judges, right? The judge's job is exactly what you might think. They are there to listen to all of the competitors, listen to them speak, ask questions, make motions, everything they do, and to assess who did the best job, who deserves to win the awards, who deserves uh, to move on, right? So they are obviously going to be uh, a very, very important part of the congressional session. Now, when you start the session of Congress, one of the very first things you're going to do is elect a presiding officer, most often called a PO. This person is a student, usually a very advanced, experienced competitor in congressional debate. The reason why that is, is that student Congress is known for being run by the students. So the minute to minute operations, like what speaker is going to be called on and how motions are recognized is decided by the students, most commonly a presiding officer. So that's the basic cast of characters, the parliamentarian, the judge, the presiding officer, and the rest of the chamber. Now you might be wondering how all of this is actually physically set up. Like what does a student Congress chamber look like? The basic layout of the chamber is going to look something like this. So as you can see, you're going to have the presiding officer and the parliamentarian up at the front so they can sort of manage things. Each member of the chamber is either going to have their own desk or their own space so they can set up their papers and their laptop and see the front of the chamber. Uh, there's going to be a space to speak. It may very well have a podium or a lectern, or it might just be a space where you stand with your notes to speak. And then off to the side, you'll have a space for the judges where they can see both the speaker and the chamber itself, and they can sort of take it all in, right? Now, we said earlier that you're going to start by electing the presiding officer. That's very important. But the second thing you do in a student congress session is you have to set the docket of the legislation that the chamber wants to debate. And when we say legislation, what we're talking about uh, is just the proposals to implement policies or adopt certain positions or stances. These are usually about one or two pages long. and really uniquely among all the events in speech and debate, they are written by the students, right? And we're going to have a separate video later where we talk about how to write good legislation. And there are actually two kinds of legislation that you're going to be seeing within a congressional debate round bills and resolutions. So first, bills are a specific policy proposal that actually propose some concrete action that the chamber will be taking. For example, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour or withdrawing military support for a particular country. Now, student Congress bills, like those presented in the United States Congress, have all of the real world elements of a bill, like the who, the what, the when, the where, the how. They explain exactly how a bill is going to happen with these basic elements that we're going to talk about a little bit later. The second type of legislation is a resolution. A resolution is merely a statement of the chamber's position on any given topic. It doesn't actually result in some concrete or direct action. For example, that might be something like a resolution in favor of school choice or a resolution in favor of single payer health care. Now these are far more general than an ordinary bill and that can actually be a good thing because if you're trying to take some stance or position on a very complex issue, you can do that with a more simple general resolution. So where are you going to get all this legislation from? Well, typically, uh, a couple of weeks before the actual tournament, you're going to get what's called the bill book or the bill packet. It, it will sometimes be posted on the tournament website. Sometimes it'll be emailed out to coaches or participants. And it's going to contain all of the legislation usually submitted by students who are participating in the Congress, right? Now, what you're going to notice about this bill book that you get is it's going to contain a lot more legislation than you could plausibly expect to debate in the actual session itself. Right? So for example, uh, if you go to a tournament and it's scheduled to last four hours, right? well, realistically, most legislation is going to take about an hour to fully debate. So if you have 16 pieces of legislation in the bill book, that means only about four of them 
are actually going to be debated in the session itself. Now you might be tempted to just pick the four pieces of legislation that you like the most and then prepare for those, but that's obviously not a good idea because just because you might nominate those four pieces of legislation to be on the docket does not at all mean that the rest of the chamber wants them on the docket and they very well might fail your proposed docket, which means that you're going to want to spend some time preparing for each piece of legislation. And while that may sound daunting and like a lot of hard work, as we're going to talk about later, it's very rewarding and actually not that difficult. Okay, so we've got all the basics in place, right? The chamber, the participants, the judges, we've got a docket of legislation that we can look at. So now is the time for the fun part, right? The reason you go to these tournaments, which is the actual debating of the legislation. So how does that work? Well, it starts with the presiding officer introducing a piece of legislation. So let's just uh, hypothetically use one of the examples we mentioned before. Uh, a, we'll call it a bill to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. So the basic way that congressional debate works is we will have that bill introduced before the chamber and then we're going to alternate speeches back and forth between those who are in favor of the bill, who are often called the affirmation, and those who are opposed to it, who are called the negation. Basically, the presiding officer will say something like, We're now in line for a speech in negation. All negation speakers, please rise. Miss Cox on recency. So, okay, we've got the debate going back and forth, right? We've got the affirmative and the negative speakers standing up when it's their turn, uh, raising their placards, right? Uh, now, of course, uh, more than one person is going to want to speak on a particular side of the bill at a given time. So how do we decide who gets to speak? And the answer is there's a system in Congress uh, that we use that's called precedence. Uh, precedence is basically a system that tries to give everyone a fair opportunity to speak about the same number of times, right? So uh, the way it works is that those who have spoken less than others will have precedence and will have the right to speak. So if you have already spoken once during a session and someone else stands up at the same time, holds up their placard and wants to speak, they will have precedence over you. And we're going to talk more in our video about parliamentary procedure and presiding about how exactly that works, right? There is one exception to that rule, and that is that if you wrote the bill yourself or if someone from your school wrote the bill, you automatically have the right to give the first speech or the authorship speech on the bill. And this is just one more reason, as we'll talk about again in another video, about why it's good to try to write a piece of legislation and to submit it to the Congress. So let's say that your bill on raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour is put on the docket and called up for debate, and you get recognized to give the first affirmative speech. So this is your big moment. What's it going to look like? How do you do it? Well, of course, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the later videos, but to put it very simply, this speech is going to be three minutes long. Um, and while that may seem like a very long amount of time once you begin, as you progress throughout this activity, you're going to realize that the challenge is not meeting the three minute time limit, but fitting all of your information within that limit of time. Now, the basic rules of good public speaking apply here. So if you've ever had a public speaking class or lesson, a lot of the same rules are going to apply. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do is be organized, right? You don't want to go just sort of talking stream of consciousness about whatever pops into your mind. Instead, what you'll do is you will divide your speech up like you would divide an essay, basically with an introduction, a roadmap of what you're going to say, and then two or three concise, clearly labeled points. Now for your introduction, you're going to want to grab uh, the listener's attention. The, the main thing that we'll come back to in this series a lot is if you want to be successful in student congress, you have to be memorable, right? You're going to be in a room with a lot of other people, with a judge listening to lots of speeches. You have to be someone who stands out and who is memorable. So you're going to want to have an introduction that grabs attention and keeps it. So this might be, for example, a really powerful statistic. It might be a humorous anecdote. Though, it might be a really powerful story. So just to illustrate, if we're looking at that bill about the $15 minimum wage, we might have a powerful story we tell about like a single mother who's trying to get by on poverty wages and how much a bill like this would help them. Now, anecdotes and persuasion like that isn't going to be enough once you get to the body. Once you get to the body of your speech, you have to combine that persuasion with also some evidence. That will give you some credibility, and it will also just signal to the judges that you've taken the time to prepare and that you're well prepared for this speech. Now, of course, since we're speaking about the first affirmative speech, there aren't going to be arguments on the other side for you to reply to. But for all our other speeches after this one, it's expected that you will be replying to the other side and making rebuttals. 
rebuttals. Um, speakers will incorporate these rebuttals into their speeches at really any given time. Um, some people will do them scattered throughout their three main points, or they will leave aside the entire third point to only responding to the opposing side. This is what really sets apart great congressional debaters from just pretty good ones. The ability to formulate ideas and arguments in the session itself and respond to other people. Now, when you respond to other folks, it is absolutely imperative that you do it in a way that balances being forceful, but also being respectful. If you've ever done other forms of high school debate, you might notice that sometimes the competitors tend to be a little blunt and maybe even a little rude. <laughs> Congressional debate is really intended to be different than that. It's supposed to be a collegial atmosphere in which we treat each other with respect, and judges are looking for that, right? So, for example, if you disagree with something that uh, Representative Lee said, I'm just using Lee as an example, so uh, you would stand up and say something like, now Representative Lee was concerned about the cost of raising the minimum wage. I respect her concerns, but in reality, what the evidence shows us is that the cost of not raising the minimum wage is actually higher. So you can see how that is a forceful response, it's a direct response, but it's also one that uses the appropriate title, Representative Lee, and it is respectful of the person. And when you put all of those skills together, as we'll talk about later in this series, you can have a really powerful speech that looks something like this. A lighthouse of liberty, a defender of democracy, a protector of peace. It's time this Congress realizes that our decisions have international ramifications because we play a role in global security. Take that sentiment and pass today's legislation. So first, I want to contextualize this debate around the INF. Half of the senders in this room want to kill that agreement, and the other half seem to think it's already dead. Senator Cox, that means the diplomacy that you're asking about are moves to save the treaty. Why is that important? Robbie Gramer from Foreign Policy explains in December of 2018 that violating the agreement and building up weapons will destroy any chance we have to save the INF. So for Senator, uh, for Senator Sukumar, for Senator Cox, and for every other sender in the when you tell us it's time the United States flexes their strength, I could not disagree more. Now you might think that once that three minutes is over, thank goodness you're done, but that's actually not the case because every speaker is required to stand for a mandatory one minute cross-examination period where the other members of the chamber can stand up to ask you questions about your speech. Now this might sound a little bit intimidating and it might be at first, but if you're well prepared, this is where you can really stand out from the crowd like this. So Russia's a threat to the United States, right? I believe that in many cases they are. And under section one, we can't fund deployment or procurement of missiles, right? So I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't have time to address it in my speech. But here's the thing, the cure and procurements that we've already given to the DOD that they've used to secure contracts with corporations like Raytheon okay. and Lockheed, those don't go away just because you pass. What, so what's the point of the INF if Russia isn't going to comply? So I'm not saying Russia isn't violating the INF right now. What I'm saying is Russia thinks the United States is also violating, and it's a much better option for us to come to the table and start working with them. Okay, but if Russia doesn't want to be part of the INF, why would they be so part of any it's treaty? It's actually not that Russia doesn't want to be part of the INF. We think then why Russia did they is violating leave? the INF, and Russia thinks we're violating the, NF, the INF. Because while a good speech is impressive, being able to think on your feet and withstand scrutiny is far more impressive to judges. Another important thing about cross-examination on the other side of the coin, when you're asking questions, is this is a good way to stay in the mind of the judge even when you're not up speaking. So for example, if you've used up a good bit of your precedence and don't have the ability to get up and speak at a given time, asking a good, well thought out, well reasoned question is a way to stay on the judge's radar. Even though you're not scored for it, you stay on their radar and you remain relevant in the chamber. And in a later video, we're gonna talk about tips and strategies, not just for speaking, but also for asking and responding to cross-examination questions. Now, after that first speech, we're going to alternate between the sides, so back and forth, pro and con, af and neg, for however long the chamber thinks that debate needs to run. Um, and once they do think the debate has kind of run dry, it might be getting a little bit repetitive, we're running out of speakers, the presiding officer will call for motions. Now motions are proposals to take some kind of action, motions to move to previous question, motions to fix a problem that came up during the debate, motion to table the bill and reconsider it later. We'll talk about how those motions work in a different video. But typically after the debate has run for say about an hour, and that's just an average, or however long it takes to let everyone more or less make their argument on it, you're gonna hear a very important motion, which is the motion for previous question. 
right? Now, previous question is a motion to end debate on a particular piece of legislation or a particular proposal. Uh, it has to pass by a two-thirds majority. But if it does, then the debate ends uh, and there is a vote on whether to pass or fail the legislation. Now, the vote on whether to pass or fail the legislation is not two-thirds. It is a simple majority rule. It's either voted up or down, and it, it is noted in the record of the chamber, and then you move on to the next piece of legislation. Uh, and that is basically, uh, in a nutshell, how a session of Student Congress works. So what does it take to be successful in Student Congress? Well, that's hopefully the question we're going to answer for you throughout this series, but it basically boils down to three main things. Preparation, understanding how the event works, and developing confidence. Now, preparation means that before the tournament even begins, you're spending your time gathering materials and preparing for the tournament. You're going to be gathering facts, statistics, powerful stories and anecdotes like we talked about. These should all be added to an outline, maybe say on a Google Doc that might be the most efficient for you, or you could even just use a notebook that you bring into the chamber with you. Now, you don't have to know everything about any particular issue, especially when you're just getting started, but as a general rule, the people who are most prepared are going to perform better. Now, in terms of knowing how Student Congress works, you're actually already better prepared than a lot of people who show up. But over the course of these videos, we're going to teach you things that go beyond the basics. For example, you're going to learn about how with speaking in Congress, speaking frequently is important. It's important to get up and talk whenever you can. Uh, and that's a good way to get on the judge's ranking sheet, is to speak a lot. If you want to be at the top of those rankings, right, if you want to be the person who wins the tournament or the person who moves on to the finals at a large tournament, it's important that you have the quality and not just the quantity. Those have to be memorable speeches, speeches that grab the judge's attention and really stand out. We're also going to talk about how a strong extemporaneous speaking style is important, right? Speaking naturally from your own knowledge and from your notes. Uh, getting up and giving a memorized speech may sound impressive, but it's not what judges and student congress are looking for. It's certainly reading from a script or a piece of paper is not what judges are looking for and developing that extemporaneous style is going to be really important. And we'll also talk about things like uh, good cross-examination, making motions, and just generally being a well-rounded good citizen of the chamber who the judge likes and wants to vote for. <laughs> And of course, the last piece of the puzzle, the last thing you need to be successful in congressional debate is confidence. Of course, this just comes with practice and experience. You're going to be nervous at your first tournament. Everyone is, I promise, absolutely no exceptions. But the sooner you're willing to stand up and speak, the easier it will become. And over time, you'll realize you're developing confidence and you're performing better. So thanks for taking a few minutes to learn just a little bit about the basics of Student Congress with us. It really is a unique activity uh, that teaches things that really no other event in speech and debate does. And it teaches leadership, frankly, in a way that no other event in speech and debate does. Um, the rest of our videos are going to be linked in the description below, and they're each going to cover specific areas of Student Congress. We would recommend that you watch them in order. Uh, and feel free to check out all, any of the other resources that we link below to because they'll be very helpful to you as well. And I think that by the time you're done with this boot camp series, you're going to be a well-prepared uh, competitor in Student Congress, like way beyond where your typical starting competitor is when they begin. Right. And again, we want to thank the Senate Center for Public Service for their continued support of speech and debate generally, and also their commitment to creating this video series. So we'll see you in part two, where we'll teach you about researching and preparing before the tournament.